The cloud is not simply about renting hardware, like servers from the internet. If you believe that companies like Amazon Web Services simply go buy a networking switch, a server or a database, throw it into a data center, and then you just rent that server via the internet, and that's the cloud. Well, I'm sorry, but you're quite likely mistaken. You see, cloud services exist on a spectrum. Some cloud services are for sure mapped one-to-one -one with physical hardware. You can just get a database or a server, but cloud services also exist in more abstract forms powered by something called an application programming interface or an API for short. APIs are the foundation for understanding the cloud. If you don't understand APIs, it's likely that you don't understand the cloud very well either. Let me start by telling you a story that goes all the way back to the origins of the cloud. It's 2002 and the dawn of the dot-com era. The internet is just making it big and a fledgling online book company is one of the horses in the race called Amazon. Things have changed a lot since, as Amazon now has a market cap of over $1 trillion, with their cloud computing arm Amazon Web Services bringing in the majority of Amazon's net profit. But back then, a young Jeff Bezos sent a now historical letter to his employees, and it said, All teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. All service interfaces, without exception, must be designed from the ground up to be externalizable. That is to say, the team must plan and design to be able to expose the service interface to developers in the outside world. No exceptions. Anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. This statement alone foreshadows almost everything that was to come in the industry. But to dissect and understand what Bezos actually meant here, we need to take a step back. What exactly is a service interface? And how do service interfaces relate to the cloud? A service is a term from software engineering. Services are an architectural pattern that allow a company to break down their technology into capabilities. But what do services and these architectural patterns with Amazon have to do with the cloud? These services we are talking about here are actually a form of something known in computer science as an abstraction or a model. An abstraction or model is a way to generalize about an idea or a topic where we remove details that we're not focusing on and instead highlight what we do want to focus on. As famously said by George Box, most models are wrong, but some are useful. What Boggs was saying is that when we try to reason about the world and make sense of complexity, we create models to represent the thing that we're interested in. These models allow us to simplify a topic by zooming in in one specific area whilst ignoring others. A good example of abstraction that you use every day is a map. Take for example a theme park map. Theme park maps are not made to scale, and we focus on big landmarks like water slides or restaurants, whilst ignoring aspects like scale and distance between those landmarks. Whereas on a surveying map, we focus precisely on scale, on gradients of the hills and other fine details. Depending on what we're trying to communicate and focus on, we use different abstractions. But as you can see, an abstraction is not a literal concept. Abstractions are representations of reality that we invent so that we can communicate with one another. And in computer science, and by extension the cloud industry, we need abstractions for exactly the same reason, to communicate. Cloud providers like AWS take literal hardware, such as physical servers, networking components, and databases, and decide how to turn that into an abstraction, just as we would convert physical terrain into different types of maps. In some cases, the cloud service abstraction relate quite closely to the underlying computing hardware that it's built upon. For instance, when working with Amazon's EC2 service, you do request a literal server and Amazon will give you access to a server almost immediately. And this works quite like if you just purchase a server on your own and plug it into the internet. But other services are far more abstract. Take AWS Lambda for instance, which is a cloud service that simply takes a zip file of code and will run that code on certain events. If there are no events, there are subsequently no servers in Amazon's data center actively waiting to process your requests. So you pay literally nothing when your code is not executing. This on-demand computing technology is known as serverless and is a very, very different abstraction to services like EC2. AWS is developing an ecosystem around its serverless family with services like step functions that allow you to orchestrate different Lambda functions together with a cloud computing paradigm that is completely disconnected from physical hardware. In a data center, you have a fixed number of servers to do what you want. But a cloud service provider can cleverly pool and share computing resources across thousands of companies. 
as services become more abstracted, services become more proprietary. In other words, the technology you're using is more specific to the cloud provider that you're with, making lifting and shifting a workload to another cloud provider harder. Let's say if they went bankrupt, changed their policies or their prices. To manage that risk, which is often referred to as vendor lock-in, companies can adopt a cloud agnostic policy, sticking to more primitive services that are less abstracted and closer to their physical hardware counterparts. But what those companies gain in portability and supposed mitigated risk is that they lose out in the benefits of those abstracted cloud services. And it's that abstracting away of complexity, management and physical hardware that is the real essence of the cloud. Companies that adopt a cloud agnostic strategy and treat the cloud like it's simply a way to rent hardware end up complaining that it's expensive, harder to manage and no additional value on running their own hardware. But the truth is they're not actually benefiting from the abstractions anyway. So let's say that you want to lean into this idea that the cloud can abstract away these physical hardware concerns. How does that actually work? How does the cloud take something like a zip file and execute it as code? And all of this works through those application programming interfaces, which is in essence a literal implementation of an abstraction. For computers to communicate, there must be some ground rules. So to communicate with the cloud, the customer and the cloud provider need some terms of engagement. There needs to be a way for a customer to give instructions to the cloud provider of what services to create, whether that be databases, compute, or even a new user. That instruction is given by what is known as an API. An API is a convention or an agreement about how two systems will communicate. When we agree some common ground rules, information can flow from one system to another, and the other system can act upon those instructions. And it's through these APIs that cloud providers implement their abstractions. For example, in AWS Lambda, the API or the agreement in loose terms is that you give the cloud provider a zip file of code and tell the cloud provider when or how they should execute the code, such as when a user logs into a system or on a schedule, such as at 9am every morning, and the cloud provider will agree to follow the instructions that you've given it. But how do these APIs look in practice? Well, there are a couple of ways to interact with a cloud provider like AWS. We can work directly through the web console to see our cloud resources effectively clicking to request, update, or delete. We can call APIs directly from the command line interface, skipping the UI entirely. Or finally, we can use a library like AWS CDK, Terraform, or Pulumi, which allow us to define our infrastructure definitions in code and send that code definition off to AWS to ensure that the cloud creates all the services, databases, servers, and tools that we requested. It's through these different interaction modes, the UI, CLI, and libraries, that we can then interact with the cloud provider. And under the hood, all of these modes use the cloud provider's APIs. Because every interaction in AWS happens over an API, that changes how we should think about the cloud. For instance, when you have a physical server, you might restrict access by either ensuring that someone cannot physically access the machine, or ensuring that the machine is set up only to allow access from certain users. However, when you do things in the cloud, almost everything happens at the API level, which means that access is granted within the rules that the API has set. The API is the boundary that exists between the external world and your cloud account and its resources. Concretely, to manage access in AWS, we have AWS Identity and Access Management, or IAM for short. If we take an example policy which defines access rules, e.g. who can do what in AWS, that policy typically defines a resource, which is something like a server, database, or Lambda function, and then also an action to be taken on the resource, like updating it or deleting it. Performing that action on that resource typically maps to an AWS API call. So almost all governance and scrutiny happens at the API boundary. If you want to see who created a server, audit trails are shown in a service called CloudTrail, which shows you every action that was taken across any API. And since everything in AWS must be accessed over an API, these audit trails become the unquestionable source of truth. The more you learn about abstracted services like AWS Lambda, and cloud concepts like access management, the more you'll understand how the cloud is just not the same as buying your own hardware, even if there are some overlaps. Thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video. And as always, I look forward to sharing your I Got The Job post on social media.